whenever you want to begin run the floor is yours my colleagues friends and everyone who's in the in the room and my name is Ron Chanessa. I'm based in South Africa. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm newly a newly crowned member in the in LNET. So LNET stands for Education Languages and Internationalization Network. So it is was founded in 2022 last year at the University of Glasgow. Actually, Paul is a is a lecturer there at the University of Glasgow. That's where he is right now. That's why I keep saying morning because it's 10 o'clock for them that side. And also my friend Nadia is the one that then told me about it. It's a network of people who are interested in promoting English across the world. So we've got people from all over the world, uh, Brazil, the United Kingdom, lots of uh, European countries, etc. So we've just started the South African uh, branch. So I've had the privilege and honor to be crowned the first one to be leading that uh, uh, sector. So I don't know, Nadia, is there something else you want to say before I can go on? I see you're unmuted. All right. She'll so keep posting in the, in the chat. So any of you who are in the literature, literature space, in the English space, academic space, please, uh, there's a link that Nadia will be posting in the, in the chat as we go, and she'll be able to even to respond to certain questions. So feel free to engage with her. I'm going to switch off my camera so that there are no interruptions with the network, et cetera. And uh, if you can just give me a second, I'm going to share my screen. So I'll probably not be able to keep up with the chats. I hope uh, Paul and Nadia will be able to do that for me. So just give me an indication if you're able to see my screen. Yes, from we can see it. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, Paul. Right, uh, I'm just going to start the presentation. So I've decided to, 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 term, uh, to coin my presentation, Cultivating a Culture of Learning, a Catalyst for Change Leadership. In fact, this was a, a topic that I was given at one of my, at one of my webinars uh, that uh, one organization in KwaZulu Natal, I see Nom Krebu is in the house. She's the one who came up with this topic and gave it to me and say, let's talk about this. So thank you so much, uh, Nom Krebo, for, for, for giving this suggestion. And after we presented this, Nadia caught up with it and she was quite interested. She thought it's something that we can also share. So I've, I've sort of tweaked it a bit so that it suits the context because it's a bit different from what we're doing uh, since Nom Krebo. But uh, for the purpose of this discussion, I just want uh, to put my perspective of leadership into context. Normally when you talk of leadership and management, what comes to mind immediately is a manager, is a director, it's a manager at work, it's a CEO. Uh, you know, people who have got management titles and roles. But I want to submit in this presentation that a leader is not necessarily anyone who's just in a position that has got a title. My submission is if you are a teacher, for instance, you are a leader in your own right because you are now leading a group of children in class. If you are a head of department at a school, if you are a committee chair, for instance, there are so many committees that you can be, it can be a religious committee, it can be a, 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 a special committee, you become immediately a leader. And here we've got uh, Elinet, which is now promoting thought leadership in, in what they've already coined the global Englishes. That's leadership as well. So if, if you happen to be, uh, you know, from us, well, from Africa, uh, we've got extended families and in our African context, uh, every role that you come with, every title that you come with as a family member also comes with certain responsibilities. So if you're a parent, if you're an older brother, if you're a sister, you know, our culture expands across the extended family. So immediately, the moment you are called a, a, a brother, you, you become a leader to your sister, you become a leader to your younger brothers. If you're called a, a mother, you are already a leader to your children. So the title leadership I submit is not just a, 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 a title that is organization related. It's actually a, a social contract co a, a, a contrast as well. Now, the, for, for us to kick started in, in this discussion, I just want to draw your attention. Uh, I, I will not be, probably not be able to see, but raise your hands if you remember any of these brands. Blockbuster, anyone? Just 
show by raising of hand or making a comment, I'm sure Paul will be able to check. Uh, anyone ever heard of uh, Haynes? I'm sure you're able to indicate. Uh, ah, Kodak. In fact, the, the famous slogan, the Kodak moment. Yeah, I, I remember back in the day when people were taking black and white pictures and then they would take uh, three, four days to develop and then you go and collect your photo. And then the my favorite, <laughs> Blackberry. How many of us remember? <laughs> right, let me just give you a bit of context to each of these ones. Blockbuster was one of the biggest home and movie video gaming rental services. In 1985, actually, it, it reached its peak. Blockbuster video had about 84,000 people employed by the organization and with over 9,000 stores across the world. But then Blockbuster refused uh, or uh, could not manage to change and keep up with the times. And it filed for bankruptcy in 2010. In 2000, uh, I think back then, it was actually approached by Netflix and Netflix wanted to sell Netflix to Blockbuster and Blockbuster turned them down and said, no, we are not interested because your niche market is too small. Your business is too small. Now, as we speak, Blockbuster does not exist at all. And Netflix is probably the biggest uh, streaming service. With Haynes, I'm sure uh, I, what comes to my mind immediately, I know the slogan, I'm sure those of you who are my age will remember the slogan, Haynes means beans or beans means Haynes because it was founded long back in 1869 thereabouts by a guy called John Haynes. And it was uh, the biggest uh, company in terms of the food industry. And John Haynes himself became known as the pickle king in, 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 in the food industry because he really was a king. But uh, funny enough, uh, again, Haynes could not keep up with the times and um, it was eventually completely taken over uh, in, in 2015, I think, by Kraft Foods. And then it became known as Kraft Haynes. As we speak now, Haynes is just a brand division uh, in the uh, Kraft Haynes uh, uh, organization. Kodak, Kodak was the, the biggest uh, film company in the world if, uh, uh, during the digital revolution, but it refused to embrace the digital revolution because its biggest selling point was photographic equipment. You know, the old cameras, the, you know, the film, uh, I don't know what else, to, how else to describe, but that, that film you would have to buy in order to put into the camera. And then uh, what Kodak failed to do was that it, it held back from developing it into digital cameras and it, 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 it it actually argued that it was not a thing, but uh, as we know now, uh, the film industry is now dominated, if not entirely, by the digital camera and hence Kodak is no more. Blackberry insisted on uh, using an, a, a, its own operating system. It refused to embrace Android. Same thing with Nokia. And then eventually Blackberry, which was the phone, I'm sure most of us have owned a Blackberry at some point. I, I did, I owned several Blackberries when they were at their peak. But because they could not embrace the digital revolution and could not um, change and use the operating system that every other company is now using, then they became defunct. So how relevant is this? I think the lesson that we learned from these companies is that, uh, change is inevitable. In, in, in other words, it is, it is a need. You cannot keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect different results. So then, if that is the case, how then do we manage the change that has to happen? I think in order to also again put it in perspective, let me start by defining two concepts. So on one hand, we've got the concept of change leadership and then on the other, we have got a concept called change management. A scholarly debates on the, the, the difference between change leadership and management, uh, they, they differ. In other words, when you're talking of change management, you are talking of 
what is it that you need in order for you to adjust to the change that is happening? In other words, the change is external. And now you have to find ways and means to, to cope and to keep it, the change under control. While on the other hand, when we talk of change leadership, we are now talking of yourself as the driving force behind the change. You have to have to be a visionary and you have to be the one that processes that fuel, uh, the large scale transformation or the large scale change. Um, for those of us who are car enthusiasts, let me put it this way. Change management would be fixing a car because now it has suddenly developed a problem. In other words, you're driving your car and then you hear this funny noise and the car can't move anymore. I know for a fact because I've got an old car. Then you now think, oh, the change has to happen. My car is no longer engaging into gear number uh, four. So now I must now learn how to drive. I must now manage the change that has happened to my car and drive in gears number one, two, and three. One, two, and three until I reach my destiny, until I reach a mechanic. That would be change management. Whereas in change leadership, again, to use the, the car analogy, change leadership would be myself thinking I need to pimp my ride or I need to customize my car. There's nothing wrong with my car. Uh, it's probably getting old, but I think for it to add uh, market value, let me change the tires and put meg wheels. Let me put a booster in the engine. There's nothing that has happened with the car, but I just want to uh, add this value. Uh, then that would be change leadership. So I think that uh, sort of puts it into perspective. Now, from a scholarly perspective, uh, Professor, John Paul Cotter, who's a, a, a leadership emeritus at the Harvard University of uh, business, business School, sorry. He emphasizes the importance of what we call dual leadership approach. Uh, he's the one who actually talks about the distinction approach between uh, what I've been talking about, change leadership uh, and leading change. In other words, one, on one hand, we've got leading change, and then on the other, according to Professor John Cotter, would be uh, leading the change. So what he argues is, is to say that for you to, uh, to, to be a, an effective change leader, it involves a sense of agency, building and guiding a, a coalition and maintaining momentum throughout the transformation process. In other words, there has to be a certain drive from you as the one that is managing the, 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 the change. Then historian and political scientist, uh, James McGregor Benz, please don't confuse him with Mr. Benz. That would be Homer Simpson's boss. So Benz, uh, the intellectual, not the cartoon, believes that uh, a renowned leadership uh, 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 leader and a, a renowned leadership scholar would be the one that uh, looks into transformational leaders and transformational leadership. In other words, transformational leadership, according to Burns, they inspire and motivate followers to exceed their own interests and work towards the collective good. So change leadership from this perspective of uh, uh, Mr. Burns is that it involves transforming organizational culture and inspiring individuals to embrace a change. Then another uh, scholar on, 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 on leadership, uh, uh, that's Bernard Morris Pass, who has uh, uh, done extensive work in the, in, in the field of research and uh, leadership studies and organizational behavior. He believes on an expanded concept of what he calls transformational uh, leadership. He emphasizes that the leader's role in fostering intellectual simulation is essentially in individualized consideration and inspirational motivation. In other words, change leadership in this perspective involves creating an environment where people as individuals, uh, they are able to think and encourage to think creatively. They must feel supported and the people must find purpose in the change process for them to be, to be carried along. Uh, I, I, I just want to apologize upfront if there are any uh, uh, all Blacks fans in the house. Uh, we are just fresh from winning the World Cup in rugby. <laughs> so we still have the, the, the drive and inspiration from our Springboks rugby team. So I just want to talk about uh, change leadership then in summer. In other words, change leadership involves 
guiding and facilitating the organization, the institution. Uh, you remember we said our definition of a leader is not just a manager in the sense of an organization, but even in a society. So even in a family setup, in a filial setup, you, one can be a leader. So it, if you are the family leader in that case, then change leadership involves you guiding and facilitating that change process. It's like when you are a parent grooming a child, there's a change process that is constantly occurring as the child is growing older, uh, has to move to preschool and then primary school and then high school. There's constant change that is happening. So you have to constantly guide that child and you have to constantly facilitate the, the, that change process. Then change leadership, I submit, uh, is about inspiring and leading people, whether they are your children, whether they are your, your, your students, uh, or whether they are a team that you are leading in, a, in an organization, to embrace change, to adapt to things that are changing. And every family, every institution, every room has got uh, uh, strategic goals. And therefore, as, a, as, as a, a change leader, your goal is to lead them to that ultimate victory. Uh, and for, for, for the Springboks, again, our analogy would be then that victory of lifting the World Cup. Not all of us would have the, 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 the obligation or, or, or the chance to be able to win the, 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 that, that goal, but at least there should be a strategic goal to which uh, change leaders are aiming to, 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 uh, to, 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 to reach. So what are the key roles of, a, of, of change leaders now that we've talked about change leadership itself? So if you are the person who's in a leadership role, role which I've submitted that all of us in one way or the other are in. So according to Paulo Freire, um, who is a renowned a Brazilian writer, uh, Paulo Freire argues that in his uh, thesis, uh, which is called Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which is essentially a treatise on how to uh, um, navigate uh, revolutions. And, and in, in Paulo Freire's uh, instance, he was talking about political revolutions, but I want to submit that when you are leading change, you are actually a revolutionary in your own way. It could be an academic revolutionary, it could be an intellectual revolutionary, you could be a business revolutionary, or even a filial or a family revolutionary because you are doing something that has never been done in the family. So he, for your friend, in his words, and I quote, he says, the revolution starts where you are. So your role then as a change leader would be, I submit, firstly, advocacy. And advocacy would be you now advocating for change. You'll be the one uh, as a change leader that must be a strong advocate, that must be in front and saying that this needs to happen. Uh, it is like you keep making noise that this has to happen. And I think this is part of the reason why we're here uh, in, in this uh, webinar, where we want to look at, we want change to happen. We want things to, to not remain the same. How then do we make it possible? That is advocacy. And we build excitement and momentum for the change. In this case, uh, in liaison, in sharing ideas. And uh, obviously, uh, sometimes it can be in academic circles, sometimes it can be business circles, education circles, etc. So there must be, uh, uh, I mean, change leaders, they must be able to overcome resistance to change. We'll talk about resistance in a short while. But the, the, the essential fact is, as a leader or as a change leader, you are essentially an advocate. And uh, according to Martin Luther King, he argues, and I quote, a genuine leader is not a searcher of consensus, but a molder of consensus. So your work is cut out if you are going to be a, a, a change leader. You need to, to definitely be able to, to communicate, uh, which brings us to that our next point, that as a change leader, uh, change leaders must really be effective communicators who can clearly and concisely articulate the need for change. We have seen the, from the opening slide that change is not only inevitable, but it is necessary. Uh, we have seen what happened to Nokia, what happens to, 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 to Blackberry Haynes, uh, Blockbuster, we talked about Kodak. And so for that change to, to, to happen, you, you need to be an effective communicator who can clearly and concisely articulate that change. And more importantly, the benefits of the change and the process that is involved in 
making the change happen or people to understand the change that is happening. Think of yourself as a parent, for instance. Your child is changing in the sense that they are growing older. And then the certain changes that are happening, it could be biological, it could be a social, you need to take them through the process, make them understand what is happening. How do you do this? I submit in this case by communicating. Uh, change leaders must always also be able to listen to address concerns, objections from other uh, others who are affected by the change because probably uh, they fear the unknown. Uh, as a change leader yourself, you are essentially a coach. Uh, uh, you, you have a lot of coaching and mentoring to do, whether it's your students, whether it's your children, whether it's your team. There's a lot of coaching. And uh, my submission again is that coaching and mentoring doesn't mean that you walk the road and then you always have to demonstrate. Sometimes your duty as a coach is simply to be the cheerleader. In other words, as a coach or as a change leader, you must help people to understand the change. You must help them to develop the skills and knowledge that they need to succeed in the new environment and for them to manage their emotions during the process. In other words, every person needs uh, what rap artists call a hype man or a, a hype woman. You, you know, from, from, from old rappers, I know for instance, a person like Buster Rhymes, there will be that one spliff star who's in the big say, yeah, 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 go boy, go boy. That's his job is just to hype him up. And then the rapper is now, you know, doing his thing on stage and he feels that as long as my hype man, as long as my women is cheering me up, it means I'm doing something right. So as a change leader, your role is essentially to hype your team, tell them you are doing the right thing, tell them that uh, it is going to be to be to be fine. And um, as a South Af as a South African uh, as a South African citizen myself, I think if you are a person who has read Nelson Mandela would agree with him when he says, if you want the cooperation of humans around you, you must let them feel that they are important. And you do not, you do that by, be, by being genuine and humble. How do you become genuine and humble? You reduce yourself to the level of a cheerleader of the people that you are managing, of the people that you are uh, 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 leading. There will be resistance uh, 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 to change. And as a, a, a change leader, you must be aware from the onset that people are going to, 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 to resist the change. So it is a matter of you being able to say, what kind of resistance am I going to get and how am I going to navigate through it? So change leaders must be able to understand the reasons for resistance and they must develop strategies to address that change, that, that, that resistance, sorry. They must also be able to create a climate where people feel safe to express their concerns and where they are supported in their efforts to make uh, the change successful. So people will be afraid and then you must give them the room, give them the time. Don't just impose what they need to do, but also align their fears. Listen to the reasons why they are resisting. Sometimes the people who resist the most are actually the ones that will become your best proponents once they've understood the reasons and the need for the change and why it is happening. So in other words, as a leader, for you to manage that resistance, you need to build trust. You need to be able to create a sense in your children, in your team, in your students, and that you understand that they are how and what the change is going to, what change is going to affect them. This means sometimes, you know, showing your vulnerable side uh, by being honest, by being transparent and willing to learn and to, to listen from them as well and to listen to their concerns. As a leader, be flexible because you are asking people to be adaptable. So you need yourself to be flexible enough to adapt to understanding to what they are uh, raising as possible obstructions or possible obstacles to the change that you are, you are advocating. The change process is, is really smooth and uh, it's really predictable. So as a change leader, you must be able to adjust your plans when and where needed. And it takes a lot of patience as a leader to manage resistance. Change takes time. So change leaders need to be patient themselves and they need to be patient with others. And they need to be willing to persevere even when the going gets tough. So how, do, do, how else do you, do you uh, play the role of a change leader? There's a lot of liaison that needs to go on. 
And when you talk of a, 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 a liaison, I need to, to, to make a distinction because we're talking of communicating on one hand. Now we are talking of liaison. Uh, I, I would submit that to liaise means to establish a connection between two or more parties. Often uh, when you are liaising, you are doing this for the purpose of exchanging information or, or, or for, for the purpose of coordinating efforts. While on the other hand, however, to communicate refers to the act of conveying information or ideas, like what I'm essentially doing now, to others, uh, whether you're doing this through speech, whether you're doing this uh, through any other means, writing, et cetera, emails, but you are, uh, uh, you are actually exchanging information, you are conveying information as opposed to liaising when you are establishing a connection. So this kind of forum where we are right now, where we've got people who are sitting in this uh, meeting from Brazil, from uh, uh, the United Kingdom, from uh, Kazakhstan, uh, South Africa, as we are meeting here right now, we are actually creating that forum for, for liaison. So what uh, uh, LNET has actually essentially done is to take the leadership in creating the change between the communication that has been happening in, 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 in leadership circles itself. And then again, to end uh, the, 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 I, to, to summarize the key roles of change leaders, I, I, I just want to take a direct quote from Nelson Mandela, who said, a good leader uh, can change in a debate frankly and thoroughly, knowing that at the end, he and the other side must be closer and thus image stronger. So as a leader, you don't have that idea that, uh, people don't have the idea that you are arrogant or you are superficial or you are uninformed. Because again, in the words of Nelson Mandela, a good leader can engage in a debate frankly and thoroughly, knowing that at the end of, uh, of, of, of the debate, the other side must be closer and thus image stronger. So I think um, we've captured the essence of the key roles of change leaders, which in one way or the other, we, we all are. So a few other pointers on uh, what it is that uh, 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 collaboration uh, uh, essentially yields when you are in, in leadership. You cannot walk it alone. Uh, we, we know the, the, the old adage, uh, no man is an island. So we need to collaborate. When we collaborate, we diverse our expertise. We get people whom who would have ordinarily thought they have nothing to contribute or nothing to share. They would actually give us pointers to say that what you are talking about, actually there's another side to it or there's another element to it. So it could be a person who's resisting, but it could be a person also who is uh, giving you the other side. And that person uh, actually helps in, 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 in you making your leadership uh, to change uh, much better. We cannot afford to not to share resources. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, we think that what we have is the whole world, when what we have is actually a piece of what the world is. is. Uh, Shakespeare says, in, I think it's in King, King Lear, or so when he says, um, one can live in a nutshell and think of himself as the king of infinite space. In other words, when you are living in a, in a, in a nutshell, you think you know the world because your world is actually the nutshell. The day that someone cracks open the nutshell, that's when the nut will realize that, oh, there's a whole world outside my shell. So when you share resources and, and when you are open to, 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 to uh, knowledge management sharing, you are actually opening others who have other forms of knowledge to share with you as well, thus creating a, a, a symbiotic relationship between yourself and the world outside your shell. Uh, we've talked about, I, I deliberately used the slide on the now defunct uh, companies. If you, if you realize a, a good number of them, the three or so out of the five that I shared, they're actually technology aligned. In other words, when you are adapting to change, you need to leverage on emerging technologies. Uh, it, 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 it is, I want to submit that technology now is moving at a faster pace than ever. So at one point or another, be open-minded to the technologies that emerge. Uh, you know, for instance, there's this general shift and there's a strong wave of artificial intelligence. It can sometimes be very frustrating. You know, I, I, I can think for you, Paula, as a, as, as a lecturer, for instance, 
uh, to discover that there's something called chat GPT. And now your, your students simply type your instructions and out of the 14 uh, students that you have, they come up with 14 different uh, responses which have all been artificially generated by the same artificial intelligence. So it can be very frustrating in that way. But I submit then that as a lecturer and I'm dealing with students who have got access to chat GPT, how do I leverage that technology? How do I manipulate the same technology so that I become the change leader? Uh, because in the end, we know the dangers from BlackBerry, etc. What happens when we do not embrace the change, when we do not leverage on the technology that is happening? It will overtake us. Then uh, I speak a lot about education because that's my field and that's where a lot of my colleagues and uh, associates in the, in, in the meeting are. Uh, unfortunately, education is one of the industries where we are not very ad adaptive to change, particularly technology-wise. So you find that the way things have been done in, in education uh, many years ago is essentially what we still emphasize and we refuse to, to, to leverage on technology. So change leadership unfortunately involves that we leverage on that uh, technology. Uh, staff development is quite crucial. Um, when you talk of staff development, uh, again, let us not take it in the context of organization only where you are managing a staff of, uh, or a group of people, but where you, uh, uh, where you are in a leadership position. Remember, even as a, as a parent, uh, your staff will be then your children. They need to be developed. They need to feel that you are with them and that you are working with them along the way. Same thing with organizations. Organizations need to create platforms and rooms for their people, for their staff to be able to, to develop, to also bring in a, a new ideas, new thinking. A, because once you expose your staff, your people to worlds that are outside your own, then you are actually making strides towards being, towards making your organization a, a thought leader in whatever field that you are doing. In other words, thought leadership would be as a, as a person who is now advocating change, you become a leader in that field. Uh, like what Elinette has, has just done now, this is quite remarkable that you can bring uh, people and, into one forum that are from different ideas, uh, different backgrounds, different cultures to talk about a single thing. So that's leadership in thought that we can actually break the cultural barriers. And now we're leveraging on technology in the form of, uh, in this case, a Zoom meeting for us to be able to share ideas irrespective of where we are and uh, what time zone we are in. So I submit again in that case that since we said you cannot walk it alone, for you to divest your expertise, you need to be involved in some form of consortium and partnerships. We've seen it work, for instance, in my organization in Penridge, where we've been able to work across uh, different uh, provinces, different geographical locations, simply because we formed partners, partnerships with uh, different organizations and like-minded uh, organizations. Some of them are directly in the education field, some of them not directly, but because we are able to come under one roof, we are able to form a, 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 a sort of understanding and a consortium, whether it's managing a project, whether it's a, a looking for a solution, or, 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 or doing uh, 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 some form of initiative in, 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 in education. At the end, uh, again, no man is an island. You need to be able to work with others as a, as a leader. Uh, when we talk of uh, competition and competitive age, we are not saying that uh, for you, you can win your competition, but still have partners. It's not always about winning alone sometimes we can actually win as a collective. So if this is all going to be done, this then ultimately leads to why we want to be thought leaders or why we want to be a change, a change leaders. In other words, for us to be able to achieve and to get to that shift, whether it's shift in mindset, whether it's shift in um, uh, embracing of change or in resistance to change, but the ultimate goal for all the uh, leadership processes that we have talked through, then would be a shift. I just want to share a, 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 a short video. It's quite old, but uh, some of you might have seen it. Um, it is about how to start a movement. And I think for me, it embraces the, 
the concept and the notion of what it is uh, thought leadership and, and change leadership is all about. So it's, uh, I'll play the video and I think it's, it's quite a short one. It's less than three minutes. Don't worry about the picture quality. Uh, there's a narrator, so you'll be able to talk you through. It's quite an old video, like I indicated. So if just give me one second, then I'll be able to play. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes. Picture yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over -worth. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follow. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. Right, ladies and gentlemen, on that note, uh, thank you so much for, for, for allowing me the time to, to speak to you. That could be the end of my presentation. I think uh, the message is quite clear. As a change leader, you must have the guts to be the lone nut who starts a movement by dancing stupidly in front of a crowd. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, absolutely. I'm I'm so happy that we had a presentation like this for our first seminar on professional development because I think it was a great introduction to the topic of leadership and I think it was um it was presented in a way that was very accessible and easy to understand. Uh, there is there is one thing that I really would like to comment um about before I uh allow the audience to ask questions uh, could you share could you share part of your slides again there was uh one thing that um really caught my eye <laughs> is there any particular slide in mind uh, yeah the... yeah it was the slide with uh, one of the cartoons the one of a guy telling people to go to the mountain full of animals Oh, okay. Then just give me a second. I'll show you. No worries. That. No worries. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, that'll be the third slide or so. Okay. Because although although I'm not uh, I'm not actually a lecturer at Glasgow I'm still a student I'm employed by Glasgow but I'm still a student at the University of Aberdeen but this is a topic that I I'm really starting to get used to and uh, yeah exactly that slide that slide with the uh, yeah. 
let's see if we find yeah this one this and one. the thing i like about this because this is this is something that comes up this kind of attitude is something that comes up quite often in my not only in my research uh, right now and i have some participants who are telling me the situation is a little bit like this except even this cartoon is a little bit optimistic in my opinion because at <laughs> least the at least the guy who says let's go guys at least is the one making the first step uh, because the situation a lot of people are telling me is that the guy says yes let's go there go to that dangerous mountain with all the animals but I'm not going to do the first step I'm going to sit at home you go there first <laughs> <laughs> this would be yes, already actually... good enough this would already be good enough <laughs> it's too optimistic <laughs> <laughs> yes actually Tell you what, what, why I found that cartoon to be fascinating is the, the courage with which he's facing the, those animals and the, being the first one to take the first step. You know, it's like when you're an, a leader, you don't always know what's going to happen. Yet you've got okay. an enviable task of saying, uh, of being the cheerleader and say, guys, we, we can do this. So that's why I put that cartoon. <laughs> Thanks. No, absolutely. And uh, I, as I said, this is what really a leader should do. If you really want to go on, want people to go on the dangerous mountain, then you go first, and then and then maybe maybe we will follow. <laughs> but thank you so much. Uh, is there anybody from the audience who has some questions for Ron? Uh, we do have a comment. We do have a comment from the chat. Uh, can you see the chat, Ron? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll see it momentarily, thanks. Uh, right, yeah. But can you read yes. for me meanwhile? Yeah. yeah, change leadership is not just about navigating the path forward, it's about inspiring others to embrace the journey and become architects of their own evolution. Wow. Wow, this is this is, this is great. I, I really I, I, I agree with that. Um, you, you, you know, I've talked about the fear of the unknown. And uh, as a leader as well, like we are saying, you don't always know the path ahead. So it definitely, it's about embracing uh, the fear of that unknown and taking that first stride with the team. Quite rightly. Yeah. No, okay, absolutely. Now I get, yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> Has anybody anything to say? In, even if it's not a question, any comments for Ron? Um, again, if you don't want to be recorded, you can just write in the chat. Mm, the chat is not being recorded, so it's uh, not going to be a big issue. So, yes, we do have uh, somebody who has raised uh, their hand. You you may ask a question. I I'm afraid to mispronounce your name, uh, Titi. Oh, that Titi. No, yes, that's correct. <laughs> thank Hello. you so much. Thank you so much, Paula. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Ron, for the very insightful presentation. Uh, I just want to comment what stood out for me when you spoke about the role of the change leaders, and at that part when they have to manage resistance. I think. What would happen normally, I think like common sense will tell you to to leave it when you're facing resistance or to respond in a in a quite unpleasant manner. But what you said would work is to build trust and to be vulnerable. So that is very interesting to me because sometimes as leaders or as a leader, you would want to assert your authority when you face resistance, but you come in a different way, in a different manner to say, you build trust, you become vulnerable. And yeah, that's quite, that was quite interesting for me. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, and I think, uh, yes, I, I use the, 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 the reference to, to, to being a parent, for instance. It's not easy as a parent to admit uh, or to show vulnerability to your children or to say to your child, I also don't know. And, and we often find ourselves as leaders in such a position where we actually don't know. And sometimes uh, when you are leading people, not just family, 
but as a, as a manager, for instance, uh, your team might get the sense that you are keeping information away from them or there's something that you are not telling them. Whereas in fact, yourself are in a position where you are also uh, not aware of what's, uh, what, the, what needs to be done next. So yeah, to be able to show your vulnerability is actually an admission to say I'm also human and we're in this together. Thanks. Thank you, Ron. You you can I think you can turn on the camera right now. I think I think yeah I think it would be nice for we for the audience to see you. Uh, I, we do have another comment in the chat. I now see why you are a good leader to us, Mr. Ron. Great presentation. I'm a leader myself. I learned a lot from your presentation. I am ready to be a better leader from now on going forward. Uh, we we can't hear we can't hear you, Ron. You're mute. I was actually laughing out loud. That <laughs> <laughs> was my colleague, and she's saying, "Yeah." So thank you so much. I'm glad you have learned something out of this and for recognizing yourself as a leader. So essentially, my argument was that uh, we all are leaders in one way or the other. Uh, don't look at yourself as a follower all the time, because then you tend to think others have to do the change for you, when in fact you can actually take the lead role. Thanks. Yeah, I, I under I understand what you said. Um, it really resonates with me. I, I know I said it to pretty much every seminar that we attend that the things that the speaker says are really relevant to me. But really, I'm dealing with a field of research in which change needs to occur, and uh, and it's all a shifting of responsibilities. As in, yeah, I. Uh, I could do something, but it's not my responsibility. It should be the practitioner's responsibility. I don't need to do anything more. I've already done enough. And it's really starting to look like that's not the case. It's really, as, as Ron is saying, it's really people need to um, need to understand that sometimes they, they do need to assume the responsibility of leadership and actually produce models um, as like the guy in the video, he moves and somebody likes what he's doing and they follow it. Yeah, and yeah, definitely. It really resonated with my own experience of uh, people needing to take ownership of leadership and uh, creating models that other people might follow. Thank you really so much for this presentation. That Again, yeah. you showed something complex I in a way that... that I think most people could understand. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, the, that guy, for me, embraces the essence of leadership. Uh, you, you look like an idiot when you're a leader. Uh, you've got an, an idea, you've got a notion. Sometimes it makes a lot of sense in your head. But the moment you start trying to take people along, you are like that guy who's now dancing like a mad person on the beach. Everyone else is looking at you, what the heck are you talking about? Because it doesn't make sense to them. So it's it's now it, it, the ball is in your court, and you definitely need to respond. And yeah, right. Uh, we do have one raised hand. Yes, you may ask. Yeah, uh, uh, it's it's not a question per se, but I just want to thank you for this wonderful time and the wonderful present. I was just thinking when he was talking about parenting and uh, and change, there are things that I've learned um, as a leader of my own organization that I use in my organization, but I learned from my children. So they I was I was teaching my 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 children something, but when it really mattered. I forgot what I was teaching and my child reminded me that you always say. So there are things that we do when we are under pressure. Um, hence, uh, as leaders, we need to be vulnerable, especially with our colleagues, our peers, so that we stand to be corrected and pointed in the right direction. Hence, we will be able to develop and use. Sometimes we have knowledge, but we never use it. But if we become vulnerable, we can be corrected and be able to use the knowledge that we already have. 
Thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm almost in tears right now. Jo Josias is my friend, uh, childhood friend. We last saw each other over 20 years ago. And I'm glad that you, uh, thanks, thanks Joseph for, for, for joining. He's almost like my brother and uh, he's based in the UK as we speak. So it's good to hear it, that you are learning something from, from your brother. <laughs> 20 years down the line, there's still something I can share. Thanks, I, I have nothing more to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you again so much, Ron. If if nobody else has any comments or questions, then uh, this is uh, the end of our seminar. As always, you will find the recording on YouTube. But you have the link right in the description. I will stop the recording right now.